Movie footage used in the kill count is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Dead Meat makes no claim of ownership and simply uses the footage for purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support filmmakers and the art of filmmaking by watching Saw 6 in its entirety on home media or streaming services where available. <laughs> Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Saw 6, released in 2009, and the directorial debut of Kevin Grudert, who was the editor for all of the first five Saw movies. I just love how much of a tight-knit family the Saw series crew is. Half of Saw 6 is stuff we've seen before. Flashbacks filling in gaps that don't need filling, a cop plot wherein Hoffman tries to deceive an increasingly suspicious police force, but the other half is a reaction to the healthcare debate that was going on at the time, surrounding the incipient Affordable Care Act. It's a little weird to see Saw get political, and of course it's not even close to being subtle about it, but I'm actually kind of into it. Plus, this movie features one of the most popular Saw traps of the series, and some seriously gory kills. Let's get to them. The movie begins with a saw trap. Duh. Co-worker Simone and Eddie wake up wearing some fancy headgear, and Billy pops up to tell them why they're there. You recklessly loan people money, knowing their financial limitations, <laughs> counting on repossessing more than they could ever pay back. Holy crap, that was one fast response to the 2008 financial crisis saw series. Nice work. Billy says only one of them is getting out of there, and the price to escape is a very biblical one. Human fucking flesh. Whoever has donated more to Billy's flesh drive when the timer runs out gets to live, while the other will get one screwed up headache, which Billy gives them a taste of for motivation. The game begins, and Eddie seems to have a bit of an advantage here. He cuts away at his belly fat and throws it on the scale. Looks like he's the obvious horse to bet on, but I bet he didn't know Simone is being played by Tanidra Howard, who won this role on the VH1 reality show Scream Queens. She ain't looking to lose this competition, so she grabs a cleaver and takes a shortcut to the finish line. She hacks off her arm, permanently maiming herself, but it ends up being worth it. She submits her arm for approval to the Jigsaw Society, and the scale tips in her favor. Eddie is killed when the screws at his temple are driven into his skull, his self-mutilation all done in vain. Play to win or go home, I guess. Simone leans against the wall and screams out, Saw 6! Not really, but you know we need to get to a title card! The first thing we're treated to is a weird blurry shot of Cecil and, oh shit, Amanda Young? Driving down the road together in my old car, the Ford Taurus. You can tell by that oval dash, for show. Then this episode's recap shows us Strom's death again to lead into the immediate aftermath. Hoffman getting out of his glass coffin and going to inspect the mangled corpse of what was once that dude from Gilmore Girls. Great work, Hoffman. I bet you're totally in the clear now. He's called to the scene of Eddie's murder, where a blue toothless Erickson shows him that they found fingerprints on the victim's eyelids, and that they've been identified as belonging to Agent Strom. But then he reveals something they had kept hidden from Strom. Agent Lindsay Perez, alive and well, with only a few faint scars left over from her encounter with Blast Off Billy. She's, uh, she does not look comfortable around Hoffman, but the feds still offer him a pretty sweet friggin' deal. We're offering full disclosure, Detective. From now on, everything we know, you know. Yeah, definitely take that deal, dude. Hoffman's confronted in a hallway by Pamela Jenkins, a reporter who recently wrote a book about Jigsaw. In true Saw series fashion, Pamela was shown in a couple of shots during the last movie, but even though she had no lines then, her role in this movie is a little more substantial. It's a little silly, but it also helps make Generic City feel like more of a real place, so it works for me. She asks Hoffman for help getting access to Jill Tuck, and he says he'll see what he can do. Right now, though, he's talking to Simone and asking her if she learned a lesson from her experience experience with Jigsaw. She responds appropriately. Look at my goddamn arm! What the fuck am I supposed to learn from this, huh? Look at my arm! At Umbrella Health, a name chosen from the nefarious fictional corporation's wiki, CEO William Easton is meeting with the company attorney, Debbie, since he's currently being sued by the family of Harold Abbott. In a flashback, we see that Harold Abbott is a dude who just wanted a little bit of that health insurance, but was denied by Easton due to a pre-existing condition. It says here you had oral surgery to remove a cyst from your jaw. Sounds flimsy, and Harold calls it out as criminal, but William says it's just part of their policy, so Harold leaves defeated. You just killed me. And he's right. Later on, we find out that Harold Abbott died of his medical conditions. I wasn't sure whether or not I should put him on the list, but I know some of y'all like big numbers, so here you go. In the present, William credits the quote-unquote dog pit for finding the loophole that allowed him to nip Abbott's health care coverage in the bud. The dog pit is a crack team of six yuppies, thirsty for their boss's approval and the chance of a bigger bonus. Dave is particularly good at his job, maybe stemming from his time denying Steve Urkel coverage for that experimental Stefan serum. Other employees include Secretary Addy, file clerk Allen, and Janitor Hank. And yes, obviously I'm pointing these people out because they'll all come back later. Hoffman and the feds head to the police morgue where the coroner reveals that while the serrated blade was used to cut Eddie's jigsaw puzzle piece out, the usual jigsaw MO is to use a more precise scalpel. And the only other time a serrated blade had been used was for Seth Baxter. The 
Man who killed your sister. Does anyone else think the feds already know at this point? Cause holy shit, they thrown so much shade on Hoffman, he's gonna need a flashlight to see. Like when they say they're gonna decode the voice on Seth Baxter's tape to see if it's someone else's other than John Kramer. Strong. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'd be nervous too, Hoffy. Let's see what's up with Jill's box. We finally get the thrilling conclusion to this Pandoran situation when Jill pulls out a bunch of envelopes telling the viewer how many goddamn Saw movies exist at this point. We'll keep coming back to this scene and the box's many contents, but right now, Jill heads back to her clinic where she's followed into her office by Hoffman. He tells her that plans have changed, the game has to start now, and that Jill, look at him, he is the Jigsaw now. He demands the envelopes and she gives them to him, at least five of them, and one of them has William Easton in it. Hoffman leaves and Jill has a flashback to a time when John was in her office, yelling at her while wearing a really bad bald cap. He said that her methadone clinic wasn't providing a real path to recovery for his clients, but that he found a way that's proven to be effective. And the proof is in the form of one Amanda Young. Apparently, Jill had considered Amanda a lost cause, but John's all like, no, she just needed a healthy dose of bear trap on her head, and then she became instantly rehabilitated. Back in the present, William Easton is hanging out at his office with some fake rain running down his window when he sees a spooky silhouette in the hallway. He takes out his handy dandy desk gun and shoots the intruder only to find out it's the security guard and oh whoops there's a pig head behind you. I didn't count the guard because he was still talking when we last saw him and I'ma just be optimistic and hope he's okay. William wakes up with an oxygen mask over his mouth and a tape plays for him featuring the man behind the puppet, John Kramer himself. He speaks to William in a familiar way, criticizing William's healthcare insurance formula because it doesn't take into account the human will to live. John spells out this movie's trap plot. William's got four tasks ahead of him and correspondingly four explosive shackles around his his limbs. He's only got one hour to succeed in his tasks or else the shackles will explode and, as John warns him, he will never see his family again. Cut to Tara and Brent who wake up in a zoo cage, confused about how they got there. Also in their cage is a tub of hydrofluoric acid hooked up to a switch that has two options on it, live and die. While Brent wants to pull the lever and see what it does, Tara convinces him that they shouldn't, so they settle on watching William on the monitor next to their cage, which gives them a pretty good idea of why they're there. We're here because of your father. William's first task pits him against Janitor Hank, who Jigsaw criticizes for his smoking habit? Christ, next thing you know, he's gonna be throwing people into buzzsaws because they eat too much red meat. But smoking is relevant to the minigame at hand, since it's based on lung power. Every time William or Hank takes a breath, the clamps around their waists will close in, until enough breaths result in some fatal rib crackage. The only way to win is for the other to lose. Who has the stronger will to live? We find out in a very well-directed scene where both men try to hold their breath, cracking on occasion to suck in some air and narrow their waistline. Eventually, Hank's tar-filled air sacs let him down, and he can't hold his breath any longer. He's killed after the clamps close all the way in on him and crush the bones in his torso. I could make a smoking kills joke here, but I feel like it'd be too easy. William is freed from the trap and retrieves a key that opens one of the shackles on his wrist. Three more to go, and you are making great time, dude. Giddy up! Underneath the shackle, William finds a tattoo reminding him of a party he sponsored to help Jill's clinic, which is where he met John Kramer. After William explained his company's coverage formula and admitted that he's the one who came up with the equation, John is is less than impressed. So in a sense, you choose who lives or dies. Who tells their story? Then John criticizes the formula for missing the most important thing of all the will to live. In the present, William continues forward in this abandoned zoo to his next task, one that involves grabbing a pair of cable crossover handles so he can do some fly wraps. But wait a minute, looks like somebody hanged that puppet! And Billy smacks into the window to explain the next task to William, which is just straight up fucking hilarious, Saw 6. William has to choose who to save, his young, healthy file clerk, Alan, or his older secretary, Addie, whose family has a history of diabetes. According to William's formula, Alan should be the one who lives, but now William has to choose for himself. And as these voyeuristic photos show, Billy points out that Alan is a lonely boy, while Addie's got a love that keeps her waiting. Let the game begin. Billy ascends like a heavenly puppet angel, and the game gets going, William having to hold the cables that keep Alan and Addie alive. He struggles as the situation grows tenser, but the tugging on his heartstrings ends up being the strongest pull of all, and he lets go of Alan's cable to allow Addie to live. Alan is hanged with a barbed wire noose, his body smashing straight into the display case glass, so William can get a nice long look at the decision he made, which cost- oh, there his body goes. Ha, <laughs> into the ceiling, all right. William tells Addy to just try and find a way out, then presses onward, with half his tasks done now and the other wrist shackle removed. If you're wondering why William has been chosen for these murdery tasks, a flashback shows John trying to get his insurance to cover an experimental cancer treatment, only for William to deny it based on that old son of a bitch, the policy. John complains about how healthcare decisions are now made by insurance companies as he tries to decide what his favorite Roger Corman movie is.
Piranha. Oh yeah, good choice, John. But yes, William's in this position because he had control over John's life. So now John is posthumously taking control of Williams. Another flashback shows reporter Pamela Jenkins finally tracking down Jill Tuck and giving her a letter that she said was found at the scene of John Kramer's murder. Jill says it doesn't look like anything to her though and closes the door on Pam. After putting the note back under Jill's door, Pamela goes to leave only to get pig-headed, get oinked. So presently, she's real close to Tara and Brent in her own little cage at this abandoned zoo. Now you know how monkeys feel, Pam. Pam's cage and the mother-son cage both have two-way mirrors looking into them, which allow Detective Hoffman to observe them from this movie's Trap Lock Command Center. Another flashback shows Hoffman's apprenticing days, back when he was setting up for Saw 3 after kidnapping Timothy Young for some rectitude adjustment. This scene is the first time we've ever seen Hoffman and Amanda together, face to face, and they do not get along. She implies he's nothing more than a big meathead, a point he doesn't disprove when he dumps out Timothy's body. Does a human being, you know, that I'm shortly about to put in my favorite torture device, the one that twists his head around. You do almost feel bad for John, though, when you see the annoyance on his face at his two child surrogates arguing all up in each other's grills. On their way to go pignap Dr. Lynn, Amanda and John run into Jill in the green tunnels. She asks him to stop his jigsawing to no avail, and he gives her that key that we saw her use to open the mystery box back in Saw, God, was it five or four? I don't even know anymore. Anyway, the box also had a mystery package that Jill takes to a hospital and deposits through the mail slot of an office door. Mysterious, yes, but don't get too peaked. It's another thing that won't be resolved until the next movie. William has now made it to his third task, A Nightmare on Saw Street. This one has his company's lawyer Debbie down below him with a device that'll stab her in the head if she can't make it across the room in 90 seconds. William will have to help guide her from above. Her pathway is blocked by a lot of searing steam that William can turn off by choosing to burn himself instead. It's super painful to watch for anyone who has experienced steam burns, especially when you see just how damn hot some of those blasts look. In the end, he's able to hold off enough of the steam geysers to let her make it across the room, where she learns that the key to her freedom is actually inside of William, having been surgically placed there earlier. She attacks him with a buzzsaw to retrieve it, but he's able to fend her off long enough that the device's timer runs out. It goes off and kills her with a metal rod, piercing her through the jaw and out the head. Ouch! Debbie becomes deady, and her burnt and punctured body falls to the floor of the boiler room. Even though that one didn't work out super great, Will still gets a key and moves on to his fourth and final task. This last one is a hell of a ride. William finds his dog pit team tied to a hugely popular trap, the shotgun carousel. Billy pops up and says that William can pick one-third of his staff to live since they only accept one-third of the healthcare applications his company receives. That means he can only save two of them by sticking his hands into a trap that'll pierce them. Two can live, four will die. Your decisions symbolized by the blood on your hands. When he does that, the trap shotgun will fire straight into the air, not hitting anyone. If he opts out, that shotgun's finding flesh instead. The trap starts and they all plead for their lives, but when this guy Aaron stops in front of the gun, William can't bring himself to use one of his two safety on him, and Aaron gets shot right through the chest by the shotgun. Man, this trap is terrifying for the people on this ride. When it's this chick Emily's turn, William does choose to save her, possibly because she mentioned her two kids. He gives himself stigmata, and the shotgun fires into the air instead of at her. Kids, they're not only good for tax breaks. The rest of the dog pit starts talking mad shit about each other, and this chick Gina tries to claim that she's pregnant, but the others yell that she's lying. When it's her turn under the gun, William decides not to play stabby hands again, and Gina gets shot to become the second victim in this carnival ride of death. Also also known as a carnival ride. The next one killed is Dave after William also stands by instead of choosing to save him. His chest is blown open by the shotgun's fourth blast, ending what could have been the Darius McCrerissance. Now there are only two people left for William to choose between, Josh and Shelby. She's up first, and William winds up doing the hand-piercing thing to save her, causing the shotgun to fire into the air. That makes Josh realize he's fucked. <laughs> Fuck! Yep, fucked. He uses his last living moments to yell at William and call him a dick. When the carnival ride dial reaches shotgun o'clock, Josh demands William's attention with some overacting. Look at me! When you're killing me, you look at me! He's killed by the sixth and final shotgun blast, ending the insane and terrifying carousel shotgun trap, the trap that has claimed the most victims of any singular trap in the series. William moves on and takes his final key. Erickson calls Hoffman away from his ringside seats at the zoo into the police science headquarters, where the tape from Seth Beck Baxter's murder is almost done descrambling. The technician Sachi works her magic as Perez tells Hoffman she doesn't believe that Strom is the one behind all this. Something doesn't sit right. Then the voice finishes being descrambled. Right now, you're feeling helpless. And shit goes crazy. Hoffman slits Erickson's throat and splashes coffee in Perez's face, then cuts out the lights and uses Sachi as a human shield when Perez shoots at him blindly. Sachi is the first to die in this scene, doing a classic death slide down the wall to go out in style. Then Hoffman pins Perez against a wall and stabs her a real nasty five 
times in the stomach with his blade. As he drives it in deeper, she says that everybody already knows about him, pissing him off enough to finish the job and kill her with a sixth and final stab. She too slides down against the wall. Good form, everyone. Well, except for Erickson, who just bleeds out on the ground for a while. He actually manages to cling to life long enough for Hoffman to leave and return with a tank of gasoline to burn this mother down. He does so on his way out the door. <laughs> what the fuck are you even about to do now, Hoffy? I guess head to this movie's resolution, which will take place at the trap plot's abandoned zoo. Jill beats him there by a few minutes and gets a good look at his little command center area before she takes the note she got from Pamela and leaves it on the console for Hoffman to see. In his zoo cage, Brent has had enough and wants to pull the lever before the timer in their cage runs down to zero. Little does he know that William is also racing against the clock, following arrows that point to family. Brent pulls the lever only for it to do nothing on either setting. But maybe that's because the timer hasn't run out yet, you big old crybaby. Hoffman arrives at Trap Plot Central to find the note and we finally learn what it is. A copy of the note he wrote to Amanda in a scene we witnessed in a Saw 4 flashback. You know, the note that made her cry way back in Saw 3. It says that he knew Amanda was with Cecil the night Jill and John lost their child. What? Yep. Remember that blurry driving flashback the movie opened with? Amanda and Cecil were headed to the clinic and she encouraged him to go jack the drugs for a fix. Freaking Saw flashbacks. It's like each one zooms out a little bit further to reveal that another character was there the whole time. Somehow Hoffman knew about this and blackmailed Amanda. He said he'd tell John about her involvement with Cecil unless she killed Dr. Lynn, meaning Amanda's murderous temper tantrum at the end of Saw 3 was somewhat forced by Hoffman. He did this because he knew it would make her fail John's test and possibly get her killed. It did, so, uh, well played, Hoffy. Only now Jill knows everything, so she walks in and incapacitates him with an electric shock. Right before William's timer reaches zero, he makes it to the finish line, where zoo walls open up to reveal his family. Not Brett and Tara, you big dummies, but Pamela Jenkins, who it turns out is his sister and the family he's been fighting to see this whole time. Brent and Tara, on the other hand, are the son and wife of Harold Abbott, which is revealed in an extended version of the flashback where William canceled Harold's health insurance. John Kramer appears on a TV and tells Tara that William just saved his sister even though he didn't choose to save her husband. He puts William's life in Tara's hands. She can choose whether William lives or dies with the choice of a leper. It's not my game. Yeah, it was all Tara's game cool? Despite Pamela and William pleading to Tara to let him live, she goes to pull the lever to kill so he can never cancel another health insurance policy again. But Tara's not a murderer like John Kramer or his protégés, so in the end, she can't bring herself to do it. But I can. You killed my father, you motherfucker! Yep, Brent pulls the lever, which lights up a huge rack of needles that swing down and stab William in the back, pinning him against Brent and Tara's cage so they have to watch what happens. William gets injected with way more than a healthy daily level of hydrofluoric acid, which is pumped into his back through those needles. The HF overdose melts his body from the inside and kills him in a super gross way, all right there in front of his sister. Bummer, dude. Meanwhile, we see the last thing inside Jill's mystery box was a reverse bear trap, the OG saw trap that's finally back in action. She installs it on Hoffman and ties him to a chair, telling him that John's final wish, for real this time, was to test Hoffman in this way. I'm not sure about the parameters of this test, but when Tara and Brent fail theirs by choosing to kill William, a 60 second timer begins on the bear trap and Jill leaves Hoffman to his own devices. Game over. Hoffman manages to head bash his hand enough to slip it out of its restraint like a Detective Matthews ankle. But even after he's free of the chair, he's got a major problem on his head. This bear trap ain't got no keyhole. A bunch of flashbacks and a swelling of the score lead us to believe that we're finally witnessing the end of Detective Hoffman's respectable four-movie saw streak. But at the last minute, he busts through a barred window to stop the bear trap when it goes off, then rips his face out of the underside of the mask before it can overpower the bars and snap open. The movie ends with a pretty cool montage of Game Over door slams. Oh yeah, there's also a post credit scene from the Saw 3 era where Amanda visits Corbett in her cell and tells her not to trust the man who will save her, meaning Hoffman. But uh, this doesn't ever really go anywhere, so whatever. Hoffman's time as an undercover jigsaw is over, but how how many kills did he rack up before he got out in? Let's grab Billy and find out at the numbers. Oh. He's chilling with a hacksaw. He's busy. I'll just take his twin brother. What? Why are there two of them? I don't know. 13 people died in Saw 6, the most of the series so far. Of the victims, 9 were male and 4 were female, going back to the usual male-heavy gender distribution of this and most other series. With a runtime of 92 minutes, that gives us a kill on average every 7.08 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to William Easton, even if I can't show the crazy final shot in the public version of this video. Just imagine like a sleeping bag full of toothpaste and bubblegum splitting open and spilling all over the ground. I don't want to give Doll Machete to Harold Abbott, cause that's boring, 
so I'll give it to Hank instead, since the effects on his fake torso when the clamps close in aren't the best. Platinum Punji 6 for Coolest Trap has plenty of options, but in this case, I'll give it to fan favorite, the Shotgun Carousel. There are so many different variations of terror on display here, it's super messed up and horrific to watch. You know, like in a good way. Rusty Mouse Trap for Lamest Trap goes to the Peck Fly Machine. Honestly, all this movie's traps were good, so I just picked the least flashy one here. Great isometric exercise, though. I'm giving every Untitled Saw sequel a personalized subtitle to help us stand out. This week I give you Saw 6, the healthcare one. And that's it! Saw 6 came out in 2009 and remains the lowest grossing Saw film of the series, but maybe that's just because the next one had all those 3D ticket prices factored in. That's right, next week is Saw 3D, aka Saw the Final Chapter. It's not really. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching today's Kill Count. Thank you for being patient with me when it comes to the second video of the week, which has been super cuts lately. The Saw Kill Counts take way longer than normal Kill Counts to make, so that doesn't leave me with much time to do other types of videos. But since you've been so good, this Sunday it won't be a super cut. I'm gonna have a video for you about the Killer Clowns in Outer Space live concert performance that I saw this week. Alright, I'll see you on that video. Be good people.